te mea tūtahi māku hei tīmata uh, kōrero e, uh, tuku atu ngā, ngā whakāro ki wera ngā, ngā tōtaro te ao Māori ko hinga atu rā, ara ko, ko tā āchi tāro rā o ko Jim Nickel nā reira e, e kaurua haere, haere, haere atu rā uh, kaoti. And Mr Speaker, <coughs> about two months ago my brother was sworn in as a district court judge at El Marae and his first week on the job was down here at the, the court down the road and around the corner and uh, on the Wednesday evening after three days in the job we had dinner here and so of course I asked him about his impressions uh, of the first three days on the job and he said to me it's very sad but if it wasn't for alcohol he would be redundant. He said 80 to 90 percent of the cases that he had seen in those three days were the result of alcohol related incidents. And I think we really need to reflect on that, that here's a, a district court, court judge saying basically he would be redundant if it wasn't for alcohol. And Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm on the horns of a dilemma because I'm also the uh, Labour's tourism spokesperson and the tourism industry and the alcohol uh, industry are, are comfortable bedfellows. And uh, I was talking to, uh, we, we have to realise that when I say that, that uh, tourism, tourists come here and they enjoy, an, uh, enjoy a drink, they enjoy the wine, the bars, that whole scene, and, it, and it's an important part of tourism, and we don't want to be uh, killjoys, but I was talking to a, a person in the tourism industry who said to me when we were talking about the whole alcohol issue, he said, Calvin, you've got to remember just exactly who you're a spokesperson for. You're a spokesperson for tourism. And I said to him, yes, that's right. And you have to remember that long before I was a spokesperson for tourism, long before I was a member of parliament, in fact, all of my life, I've been Māori. And I have to balance up the effect, the impact of alcohol on Māori. And I just want to quote a few things from the Alcohol Advisory Council of New Zealand's Māori Action Plan in uh, 2009 to 2012, it says 66% of Māori youth aged between 12 and 17 years of age identified themselves as drinkers. And these are people who aren't even legally allowed to drink, but 66% of Māori uh, already identify themselves as drinkers. 36% of all Māori surveyed were binge drinkers, with Māori adults reporting that they had consumed on average 8.9 standard drinks on their most recent occasion. So nine standard drinks. So some people would have had one or two, others would have had 15, 16, 18, 19 standard drinks on their most recent occasion. 31% of Māori adult drinkers reported getting drunk on the most recent occasion, with 16% reporting that they had intended to get drunk on that occasion. But we're still... 45% of Māori youth aged 15 to 17 reported getting drunk the most recent time they drank alcohol, with 25%, a quarter, reporting that they had planned to get drunk. 66% agree that it's acceptable to get drunk at parties, and we've just heard the member uh, Katrina Shanks talking about how people in, go down, you go down to Courtney Place there and people are deliberately getting drunk and it uh, worries me, concerns me about the, the vulnerability excuse me, of our intoxicated youth. Um, most Māori drinkers reported having experienced some form of harmful or regrettable experience from their drinking in the previous 12 months. Uh, added to that, Te Rau Hinengaro, the New Zealand Mental Health Survey, also identified that the most common lifetime disorders among Māori were anxiety disorders at 31%, followed by substance use disorders at 26%, and I'd say that the anxiety orders are, are contributed to by, in no mean way by the uh, substance use, Mr Speaker. Though that, those um, facts that I've just read out from that report also uh, are supported by my experience up in Kaitaia as, uh, as an educator up there. I recall having a conversation with a, a policeman who told me that on Thursdays, Fridays and Saturday nights, how they as police go around and they pick up, drag up intoxicated uh, school age students, primary school age, intermediate age, college age students from the alleyways, the car parks of, uh, of Kaitaia. And he, 
He told me how they have to drag them into the car and half the time the kids vomit in the back of the police car. They get them home to the parents. They knock on the door. The parents don't know where they've been. And basically they say, here's your child. Just make sure they don't choke on their vomit tonight. And that's the reality of the, of the situation in Kaitaia. Uh, he, he told me about one particular girl who went to the school that I was principal of who uh, he had to pick up one night, uh, totally comatose. And I said, that girl, their family cannot afford to buy alcohol. She cannot, she, they don't have money. Where does she, how does she get the money to buy the alcohol? And he said to me, she doesn't buy the alcohol. She gives favours to the, the guy at a particular liquor store and that's how she gets her alcohol. And Mr Speaker, we have to be mindful of, of this girl. Is a 12, at the time she was 12, 13 years of age, giving favours in return for alcohol. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, um, the, the, alcohol, the Law Commission Alcohol in Our Lives um, curbing the harm report says this. It says there's little scope under the present Act for communities to have a say in licensing, licensing decisions. And, and Mr Speaker, this uh, bill that George Hawkins has brought to the House changes that. It gives communities a chance to have a say in, in alcohol licensing decisions. <clears throat> the, the report also says a common theme in the consultation was the disempowerment many people feel because of the existing legal framework effectively discounts the views of the local community when making decisions, decisions about where and how alcohol is sold. Several people told the Commission, uh, told us the category of people who can object to a licence application needs to be widened, but the real concern of many was that even though they lived in the neighbourhood, there was no basis on which they could object to a licence application other than in relation to the suitability of the applicant. And this bill changes that, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, the report says that the community had, uh, had alcohol-related problems and locals did not want any more liquor outlets in the area was no basis for an objection says community groups are increasingly expressing their concerns about alcohol and its impacts as our consultation demonstrates. They want more say in decisions about where and how alcohol is sold, supplied and consumed in their neighbourhoods. And Mr Speaker, the bill that George Hawkins has brought to the House does exactly that. It gives the communities more say uh, on where and how alcohol can be sold. It also uh, says that the bill requires an applicant for an on licence or an off licence to carry out an evaluation of the social impacts on the community. Mr Speaker, I ask, how do you carry out a social impact, uh, the impact on a 12 or 13 year old girl who uh, has to give favours to, a, to a, uh, somebody in exchange for alcohol? The, the social impact there is immeasurable on her life and her family's life and into her future, Mr Speaker. Um, I, I have to say, us, we as Māori um, have a bit to answer for ourselves, and I was just uh, talking to my colleague Stuart Nash about when our Marae dining hall was opened in 1990 uh, up north there, and um, we, we had 50 kegs of beer. We only got through 38 of them that night, and that's something that we sort of like, we're, you know, I think back and I, I think about our attitude at the time, we were sort of like laughing about it, and that sort of illustrates the attitude that we have towards glorifying alcohol. And, uh, you know, it, when I stand to speak now, Mr Speaker, I'm actually embarrassed by that attitude, by us uh, as Māori, just uh, le allowing alcohol to become such a, a big part in our lives. And... I think that, uh, that this bill, um, although it's, hopefully it will go some way towards changing that, that attitude, but it certainly gives communities the power to, uh, to make decisions regarding alcohol within their communities. Thank you, Mr Speaker.